Welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. I'm Pete Mazzetti. It's actually public access night tonight on the Pete Mazzetti Show. And with me to, to discuss what's going on with public access in the state of Connecticut is Chuck Lewis, who's the executive director for Valley Shore Community Television. Thank Hi, you. Chuck. Thank you, Peter, for having you me buddy? on tonight. Nice, welcome. Nice to and be here. And we also have Joni from Nutmeg TV on via Zoom. Joni, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for coming down. So, Joni, tell us a little bit about yourself and the history of Nutmeg Television. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know I'd be talking about that, Pete, but uh, thank, <laughs> That's you, okay. thank you for the, for the opportunity. You're um, I've been in Peg Access since 1994, okay. and I didn't start as the executive director. I started doing public relations and community outreach. Prior to that, I had worked at the Aetna for 16 years and had a lot of corporate experience. And so I was able to bring that to Nutmeg TV. And uh, when our executive director uh, left to uh, go on to other things, I applied for that job, and I've been doing that since 2005. Nutmeg TV is a regional facility, very much like what you have there, mm -hmm. um, and we handle eight cities and towns, about 234,000 residents in oh, central wow. Connecticut. And Chuck, tell us a little bit about yourself and your city well, and thanks. your station. Thanks, Pete. Um, I've been in the um, television business for about almost 40 years. Um, I started doing commercial uh, pr uh, video production work, uh, small company, uh, just outside the campus of Yale um, in New Haven for many years, and then went into, um, did some work for the Weather Channel. Um, went off and did, uh, I was producing a series of educational programming for the Weather Channel down in Atlanta, Georgia, which we know we all know and love when we see weather events happening in the country. And right. um, from there, I went to uh, education, um, working for the Manchester uh, uh, public school system, and I was a liaison. Um, we were doing a lot of distance learning type uh, television with Cox Communication, which okay. was the service there in that area. And then from there, I went into um, started uh, uh, working with the folks from Fox and started a Fox Student t uh, Television News program, um, which became a statewide yes, uh, opportunity for young high schoolers to produce um, local news stories. And from there, I went to Region 17 schools and uh, spent 20 years there teaching uh, broadcast journalism and television and film production. So, uh, and then that brought me, I was, as I was closing in on retirement, I saw a, um, a cable access opportunity, uh, which was formerly run by Comcast out of Clinton, Connecticut, and mm -hmm. petitioned the state and Comcast to uh, turn this into a regional nonprofit. And right. uh, here I am 11 and a half years later, um, enjoying retirement, but also as an executive director of uh, Valley Shore Community Television, which serves nine towns in the Valley Shore community uh, area. And uh, we're producing a whole lot of content. We're busier than ever. And uh, we're, we're very happy that uh, to be part of the, have Pete Mazzetti part of the uh, family of uh, local programming. Thank you. Hey, Joni and Chuck, now this is a question for both of you. Let's explain. I understand there's a statewide blackout going on. Let's explain it. Um, in simple terms, um, <laughs> together, um, yeah. uh, both regional ca uh, cap, uh, cable access providers and independent cap providers, we want to include all of, all of them, mm -hmm. uh, decided that this was an, area, an opportunity to raise awareness about what it would look like if our airways went dark right. um, to show the value that we, br that we bring to the community. Um, we currently have a bill up in Hartford that's trying to extend and, and, and provide funding so that we can continue doing the work that we do in our communities. Okay. Um, real short story, and Joni's, you know, she's the quarterback of this team, and, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to her very shortly, but very, very succinctly is that um, we've got our funding mechanism, which has been um, known as a subscriber fee that comes from what we call our legacy customers, the, right. last, the last survivors of the, the folks in our state that are using cable. Uh, television. Right. Um, over the years, the last uh, five years, there's been an acceleration of people, what they know, known as cutting the cord. Yes. Those are the people that are taking advantage of the internet and they're streaming select services to bring their television into their home. They no longer have cable. Right. So as a result of that, we're, we are losing the subscriber income, which is a very small uh, fee that comes back to us to keep cable access um, alive in our communities. Mm -hmm. And Joni, I'm going to pass the baton off to you so you can talk a little bit more about the blackout and, and, uh, and make sure I fill in all the blanks. Oh, thank you, Chuck. I 
I'm so happy that we've been able to partner together. You know, Pete, it's been a true David and Goliath for the yeah. last five years trying to get this funding stabilized mm -hmm. as it has been for so many years. And in order to do that, we had to partner together. And we chose to do that with other regionals across the state to have our voices be louder and be able to hire uh, a lobbying group to be able to help us in Hartford uh, okay. because it's a very involved and complicated issue when you're trying to get bills passed. but. Uh, the blackout is uh, a two week period of time where we're showing videos and giving stories okay. about what public access is and what's going to happen if it's gone. Because, you know, you don't miss it till it's gone. Right. And exactly. uh, that's going to happen in Connecticut. And I understand we have a video that we're going to show right now. So, guys, if you want to roll that video, please. Public Education and Government Access TV, or PEG, has continued to serve Connecticut for over 30 years, connecting communities with local information, entertainment, education, and a transparent source for local government meetings. During this time, we've earned the trust of our communities. We are different than commercial media. Public access stations are not a network. They are publicly funded organizations that serve each of the 169 cities and towns. While some stations are operated by cable companies, almost half of the stations in Connecticut are managed by local nonprofit stations, like the one in your community. In fact, PEG stations are some of the last independently owned and operated TV stations in the country. Large and small, rural and urban PEG stations reach both cable and internet customers in Connecticut each year, with hyper-local content that educates, informs, and inspires, and that reach extends beyond the screen. Local stations are active members in the community, working with families and educators to prepare children for future success bringing attention to state and local issues, and playing a role in healthcare and veterans affairs. At PEG, we view our audience as residents, not as consumers. We deliver award-winning local community programming, such as documentaries, science, history, sports, cooking and arts to our audiences, when, where, and how they want to watch. Since PEG's founding, federal support and state funding legislation has always been the cornerstone of what makes this possible. A fee is assessed to cable companies on each customer as they use public rights of way to reach billable customers. This fee is passed on to fund PEG. Every year, Pura reviews PEG funding, performance, and community engagement. Each station has a unique budget that includes legislatively mandated funding individual donations, as well as revenue from other fundraising and grant sources, fulfilling the vision for a public-private partnership. But no matter how much fundraising for stations in rural or underserved communities, funding dollars can represent more than half of their budget, and without it they won't survive, and communities across Connecticut will lose access to this essential service. PEG stations are making a difference strengthening communities, improving lives, and serving all residents in Connecticut. And welcome back, Chuck and Journey. We actually just saw a short video on PEG. Can we maybe talk about what we just saw? Yes. You know, let me say, let's mm. say that Pete Mazzetti wanted to have his own cable company. In Connecticut, um, it would require a thousand dollars and an application. And you could then uh, start to use our public streets as an infrastructure in order to bring your wires down the street and okay. connect to billable customers. Right. And the only obligation that you would have as a cable company mm -hmm. is to pay 5% gross earnings tax to the state. Right. You'd have to fund a grant 
program called PEGPESHA, which is um, for schools and other nonprofits to be able to apply to. Okay. And you would have to fund PEG access. That would be the only obligations that you would have. I, I believe you also have to carry the broadcast stations. Okay. Now, the deal that you make mm -hmm. for that is uh, to, to take care of all those things. And Connecticut says to you, you know what? You don't have to pay any taxes on any of your personal property. Okay. So all of your trucks, your wires, any of your cable equipment, you don't have to pay any tax on. And you can use our streets in perpetuity ongoing with no review process. Uh -huh. And so that's the deal that was struck in 2007. Okay. And that's a deal that has been around the 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 uh, the tax exemption has been around even longer than that. And now these companies are shirking that responsibility because their delivery has changed. They still use the same street. They still use the same wire. They still connect to the same customer, but it's a different delivery method. And so they're using a loophole in the law and kind of skating underneath that. And as a result, we're losing our funding. And so, um, if we no longer have our funding, then those stations will go dark. Right. Now, in simple terms, please explain the bill. <laughs> it's, well, uh, go ahead, Joni. <laughs> HB 5446 yeah. is a heavy lift, and it was designed that way because the broad spectrum of what needs to happen in Connecticut and what's what's happening and trying to be happening in other states uh -huh. um, is to level the playing field, have a bit more of a balance. Uh, but there is a lighter lift amendment out, and that's the one that I want to discuss. Sure. And the lighter lift amendment is just simply clarifying the existing law that any customer of a certificate holder for either cable or video, and those companies would only be Cox, Comcast, Altice, Breezeline, and who am I leaving out? Cable uh, Charter. Not Netflix and Hulu. There's a lot of rumors going around that's being stirred up by the opposition that this is the major league baseball and this is Hulu and Netflix and, and none of that is accurate. These are only companies who have physical infrastructure on our streets and uh, any customer of uh, those companies would pay the fee to fund PEG. Okay. Now, obviously, what does the bill mean for public access? I know we talked about it a little bit during the opening, but maybe can we maybe explain it a little bit more? Yeah, um, the, the, what the bill would mean would be to clarify in crystal clear terms what the companies are supposed to be doing, what All they right. agreed to, right? They made a deal and now they're skirting underneath that deal. And so this would make it crystal clear that, uh, you know, you must pay if you want to use our public streets right. and you want to use them to profit, then you have to pay. It's like if I had a a sandwich shop in the local plaza and you had a shoe store next door to me and I had to pay rent and you didn't, that's not a fair playing field. And no, that's what's happening yeah. right now. And so this bill uh, would certainly take care of balancing it. And, you know, I want to add before I turn it over to Chuck here that sure. um, we applaud the, the companies and the technology. Isn't it wonderful to watch what you want, when you want, how you want? The problem is everyone must pay their fair share. Right. And so, you know, we believe in capitalism and make all the money you want, but pay your fair share. And if you're using public rights of way, obviously uh, there have to be public benefit fees that are associated. Right. Chuck, do you have something you'd like so to add? So I, I had one of our volunteers stop me just recently and I, I share this story. I shared this story with legislators when we testified a, um, a month or so ago that this person owns a local business in town okay. and pays rent and they also pay, um, they also pay um, personal property tax on sure. that. Um, 
So to Joni, to Joni's point, it would be like, why would one business in town that's paying their fair way and, and, and paying uh, rent to do business, why are we giving rent free access to these companies who are collecting and making billions of dollars, by the way, billions of dollars. Right. Um, and, and to have you know, a rent-free access to a cable that comes into our homes. Nothing's changed at all. It's the same cable that's been coming into our homes using the same rights of way. Uh, that part hasn't changed. One thing that has changed, though, mm. is cable access providers like ourselves. We've evolved. Even though the funding mechanism hasn't, hasn't evolved, we all have evolved. We have state-of-the-art facilities. We produce more content now than we've ever done. Our, our communities rely on us for um, producing local content right. um, in, in a variety of different ways. We bring stories to our community, about our community and things going on in our community that people would never be aware of. Um, we're one of the last local um, providers of content that, that, that exists as many papers in our local communities are, no longer exist. Right. But the other way we've evolved is that we all have di a digital presence. We, we, aren't, we, we aren't just limited to the cable subscribers anymore. We have a strong digital presence. So people are taking advantage of that digital presence through that same cable that's coming into the living room um, uh, through this, the same cable that delivered the cable to their home. As Joni said earlier, they're just flying under the radar now and skirting uh, their op, their, their, um, what, what they agreed to originally and, and to provide um, community access. Now, this isn't one thing that I want to make clear. This isn't just a Connecticut issue. This is actually a nationwide issue. Really? And our, our neighbors to the north, in fact, Maine, recently um, they just passed legislation that's going to keep their community access providers alive. Wow. Um, why would why Connecticut, being uh, as, you know, an inst it has one of the, some of the best institutions, some of the greatest brain trust in the country, why are they going to let this wonderful digital media town green disappear from our communities? Right. We talk about how important it is to provide, um, you know, the resources to our to our communities to keep them informed. Many of the legislators, in fact, use, they've been, many of them have been guests on your shows. Yes. I, I would like just one, mm. to one moment to talk a little bit about, just real briefly, the sure. type of programs, programming that we're bringing to our community, why it's so important to them. Please. Um, we recently did a show called Little, um, uh, Little Compassion. It's a water uh, lantern uh, celebration. It's a nonprofit in Deep River, Connecticut, that builds a safe and inclusive community for all, regardless of um, their, their neurodiversity. And basically, um, it provides an umbrella of compassion and it brings these folks together. So we did a story on this. Not only did we you know, bring, raise awareness, but we, the community, many people in our community were unaware that this uh, uh, service was available to, to um, some of our residents. Um, Common Good Gardens last year, we did a piece on uh, growing food for people in need. They raised hundreds and hundreds of um, pounds of um, uh, local vegetables for our local food kitchens. Um, we did a story last year on a, a, another small operation called the Free Treasure Den. Um, it's located in Old Saber, Connecticut. It's a mission to provide slightly used in, and, um, and new clothing for all ages, including household goods, hygiene products, baby furniture, and so much more. We brought that story to our community, and they responded back to us to saying that they had um, a, a flood of new people taking advantage of these services. They would never have heard that without you know, that content coming from our, our community. Right. Um, so that's just a small example of, of some of the things that we've done. I had, I had the, the pleasure, and you've had them on as guests for many years, for, t uh, for 20 years of hosting and um, uh, a wonderful holiday show that we are grandfathered, and we provided a telethon <laughs> that's normally not allowed on cable access, but we are grandfathered under the laws, and, and Comcast signed off on it many, many years ago. We raised over $600,000 for local nonprofits in our region. Wow. Um, during my tenure at that time. Um, not only did we raise funding, but we also raised awareness by producing dozens and dozens of videos for these operations. And they were all local nonprofits that were giving back to our community. So it just, you know, it bothers me when I hear about people challenging our relevance and not wanting to support cable access because we do so much more than that, that, that appears to the average person. Um, you know, they said the, the cliche that we keep hearing is, oh, well, we got YouTube TV. Um, I want to throw that back at you know the, those naysayers and say, well, does YouTube TV provide 
uh, a studio of this of this magnitude? Do they provide um, a five camera remote package live production to uh, broadcast local graduations? And just nope. a small example, the local debates that we broadcast live to our community. YouTube t TV is a conduit and a vehicle for airing that, but they aren't they aren't producing that co that content that's so important to it. Um, Joni, I know you probably can offer a little bit from your end of the same same kind of stories. Yes, absolutely. And it's wonderful to hear what you're doing down there. And we share this content sister station to sister station, mm -hmm. right? So the Pete Mazzetti show, for example, the things that you talk about, Pete, we bring up here to our area right. and we air them here. And we do the same. There, there's content here that we can share to your community. We like to do that. But let's not forget something. What's that? These companies have the obligation yes. that as long as they're using our public streets, our telephone poles, and the wires that run to customers, their one and only obligation is peg access. And so the fact that they're trying to skirt it is bad enough. I mean, if you ask anybody in Connecticut what they think about their cable, they're going to have stories to tell you. <laughs> right. um, we used to partner with these companies years ago, and um, it was wonderful collaborations. So we are here. We are relevant. It was proven in a study that uh, Pira did, um, which was a wonderful way to showcase our relevancy. Uh, however, until they're doing something with satellite and they're not using our public streets and highways, uh, they have a responsibility to pay the landlord. And Connecticut has lost $35 million on the low side in gross earnings tax. And those taxes go to fund a lot of very important public benefits oh, yeah. in our communities. And the tax exemption for those municipalities who are out there listening, many of the assessors aren't even aware that this tax exemption exists. And there are millions of dollars that are being denied to our cities and towns because these companies are getting this exemption. And we're the only state in the country still allowing that. Wow. Question for both of you. How important is public access to you? Joni? Well, I'll tell you, when you recognize that in 1984, when the Cable Act was put into place, uh -huh. the reason that it was put there was as a platform for the public to be on the system, to be on the channels. And uh, it's very different than holding up a cell phone, right? I wouldn't know how this interview <laughs> would go right now, Pete, if you were holding up the cell phone and we yeah. were conducting it. Yeah, right. These are public platforms that anyone can go at no charge and produce content that's important to them and their communities. And you know, Chuck, we're all very hyper-local. So what's happening in Farmington, maybe at a budget meeting, is going to be different than what's happening mm -hmm. in Essex. Right. Uh, and so these are hyper-local platforms. Uh, we use them as training opportunities also to help folks get jobs in the TV industry, which are very hard. Chuck, would you speak on that for a minute? Because you've got a couple of success stories. Yeah, um, to that point, um, one of the greatest tools that I had in my toolbox as an educator was a cable access studio mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the equipment that was available to me. Um, I have had some wonderful success stories. One of the greatest gifts of uh, the noble profession is being an educator. It may not be a high paying profession, uh, profession, but it's certainly a noble profession, is hearing back from past students and telling me what they're up to. Um, just a couple of quick stories. Most recently um, heard from a young lady um, who's a um, producer for a very, um, very popular Apple TV Emmy winning award show, uh, Ted Lasso. Okay. A former student of mine who started in my cable access studio at, up at Region 17, which is the educational access um, at Haddam Killingworth High School. Also have uh, two wonderful reporters working at CNN. Uh, Washington correspondent Jessica Schneider um, was a former student of mine doing really? wonderful things as a reporter. Started also uh, in a cable access studio doing a, a local news show mm -hmm. um, in Manchester, Connecticut. Um, and then I have an, another young man named Will Ripley, who's the Asian correspondent for CNN. Also, um, his roots and uh, started here in a, a cable access. So just so many. And I have another young man just recently landed a job here in Connecticut, J Channel 30 WVIT. We're hoping to get him to do a story on this very soon. <laughs> um, 
Um, and Mr. I know Geis, who you're Kev I know, Kevin, I know who Kevin you're Geis, talking about. Kevin Geis. Uh, <laughs> I do. He spent a lot of time in this particular studio. He was out doing a lot of sports stories for us. And yeah. uh, so, yeah, so many wonderful stories. To Joni's point, that it's a training ground. Um, and, you know, uh, the workforce partners, it's so important that we're, we're still educating our youth. And education is so important to not, not only the youth, too. Um, my, I have two wonderful volunteers to tell, sharing their story with me. They're also former retired teachers, educators. They're behind the cameras tonight. Yes, and we're are. so grateful for those volunteers. But they've Absolutely. found something that they love and do. The first thing they said to me was, we love doing this. And, yes. you know, that's so important, too. And I, that goes on at every single Access Studio across the state. Not just here, but every Access Studio. All right, last question for both of you. How can people support the bill? Uh, it's important um, to that effect that um, we write our local legislators. Okay. Um, we also, um, we have a sign the petition and I think we can bring that QR code up and also the webpage. If you yeah. have your phones, you can shoot that right now and it'll bring you right to that webpage. If you put your phone in photo mode, yeah. that'll bring you that, that QR code, will bring you to the website where you can sign the petition. Um, more, more and more people are signing that petition. We're getting a lot of, a lot of um, traction in the last few weeks. Um, we're in the final two weeks of this session. It's imp more important than ever that we, um, that we really um, make every effort. Um, and legislators and also Governor Lamont, um, he needs to hear from uh, uh, constituents as well across the state. Joni, you have any other suggestions what they can do, our viewers that are watching this? I do. It's very important to stand up for free speech, and this is the platform for free speech. As we see some of the other mediums go away, newspapers, et cetera, uh, it's very, very important. So please sign the petition. And if you go to the website, which mm -hmm. is digitalequityconnecticut.com, there's a one button link that if you hit that button, it goes to every legislator in Connecticut, as well as Governor Lamont and Lieutenant Governor Bicewich. And there's a pre-filled form letter that's there. You can choose to change it if you'd like, or you can use the one that's right there. Okay. And I will tell you that we are up to about a thousand signatures in a very short period of time, which is going to speak volumes. We also have a mail bag that will be hand delivered to the governor uh, with all the letters from people in Connecticut saying, don't shut the show on peg access in Connecticut. Connecticut cannot be the first state in New England that shuts the lights off. Uh, as we see our sister states, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, New Jersey, all doing what they can to support PEG. And I know states have fiscal budgets and I know things are tight and there's a lot of people with their hand out, which is why we need to hold the feet to the fire of these cable companies as, as long as they're using our streets, mm -hmm. they have to pay their fair share. And Pete, I want to thank you so sure. much for everything that you've done. Yeah, I understand you. that you almost have 600 shows. I believe it's I believe it's over 600. And Joni, I actually want to thank you and Nutmeg for actually airing my show. <laughs> oh, we're delighted to do so. And that's what yeah. makes the state what it is. So keep doing what you're doing. You got it. Thanks, Joni. Thanks for coming on tonight. On behalf of, thanks, Chuck. Thank you. You're very welcome, you Peter. It. Thank you for all you do. You got it. Thank Appreciate you. you. Thank you for everything. On behalf of Chuck and Joni, I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks. Good night, and we'll see you next week.